All right, I think we can get started. Welcome, everybody. How are you to doing today? There is such a nice weather outside, isn't it? Nice autumn day. I like autumn more than summer and winter. How about you? I like spring the most, autumn second, summer and winter, well, don't make too much a difference. Actually, I don't like winter too much, especially if you live in a city like Ankara. It's freezing cold. Um, all right, I, I hope everything is going OK. And as you should uh, be aware of the fact that we will be having progress report meetings in my office starting today. And I will start with uh, Madame Secretary General, <laughs> the Nations Unies. Uh, so, and then we will meet in 10 minute intervals, at least uh, for this week. And in two weeks time, we will repeat, and I will probably assign the same time slots for every group, but on Thursday, we, I mean, on the following Thursday, not this Thursday, but in two weeks time, uh, the Thursday teams, I mean, or teams that, with which I will have meetings on Thursday, will have their meetings most probably on Wednesday because I figured out that some of your friends are taking this international organizations, right, or international law course from Professor Yuxelinan. And as he starts his classes on um, half past, I guess, half past noon, right? So uh, you cannot meet with me. And Thursday teams will be meeting on Wednesday. And why I do not have, excuse me, Metin, again, is there a problem? Yes, why don't you ask me? Our meetings on Wednesday, but we have both uh, in the IO stars. All right, so why do you speak among each other? Why don't you tell me? Are you going to resolve the problem by yourself or by consulting with me? <laughs> All right, so I can, uh, I can fix another time for you, for, for, for your team to meet with me. And so when you started, uh, you said at half past noon? Half past one? <coughs> At one, sharp. All right, so we can change the time. Well, the reason why I, I, know I was just about to say this, if you had not interrupted me, uh, as to why I, I'm not going to meet with you at half past noon tomorrow is because I have a meeting at 11 in the city and I'm not sure if I can come back to Bill Kent by half past noon. So, well, this is uh, highly likely. So if you don't mind, I would uh, just kindly ask from you, your team at least, to uh, meet with me a quarter to one, right? At one, uh, just a quarter to one. And unless you see me in my office, you can just leave. I mean, because that, that means I will uh, somewhere, I will be somewhere in the city. Okay, um, so this is one thing. Please uh, make your friends know about this, and I expect every single member of the teams, right? I don't just want to see some representatives of the representing delegations. So all four of uh, team members uh, should be present, and I will, in that respect, take attendance of those attending, unless we have something very urgent health problem or a family problem or something else, you can of course be excused. Uh, but um, next time you should definitely uh, take precautions to be present at the meeting. All right, um, one quick thing about uh, these sort of uh, two issues, op-ed and simulation. One of your friends just asked if op ed should be chosen from uh, among topics that I have published so far. Well, I'm not that kind of person who impose upon you my own will. So therefore, you can choose any topic you like, provided that the subject matter falls within the scope of this course. So um, for instance, the gender and security in the Middle East, I don't know how, if it fits. But something that has to do with Middle East security uh, issues. Therefore, it is up to you to pick up any topic for op-ed. But if you like, if you're not sure about it, if you have any uh, confusions, just you can drop an email and ask. For instance, Fatih Chalkan just yesterday at past midnight sometime sent an email asking me as to which one out of four topics which he had studied already, and thanks for that, and uh, Saudi ar arms deal, 
Iranian nuclear program and other stuff. So he asked me as to which one I would prefer. I said, well, just do some more research, fine-tune your subjects, and at least have uh, two uh, topics, and then ask me. So, okay, um, and by the way, I should also uh, express my uh, very positive feelings about some of your friends. Doesn't mean that others don't uh, deserve that, but I sent uh, an email to Egypt uh, team on, on Sunday afternoon and telling them that I had received an invitation for a meeting in downtown at USAC, USAC Strategic Arashtramalar Kurumu, and that they invited me to attend this uh, meeting, where, which would be attended by the Egyptian ambassador and a high-level delegation from Egypt. And I uh, wanted to let this Egypt, Egyptian team know about it. And they replied quickly, within an hour or so, and that they said they would attend the meeting, and all three of them, one of them had a uh, different uh, thing to do because it was a very short notice uh, um, information that I gave them and they attended whole day as far as I understand they very much uh, benefited from this meeting uh, Eral, right? and, 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 and so congratulations uh, you were there a minute too so, give us them Fine. <laughs> so uh, Enis Misty where is Enis by the way? Well, for the record, Ennis is <laughs> absent. <laughs> okay, so uh, maybe he has a trouble because he's a very good student. Anyway, um, so this is, uh, this is also very important. Another thing, for instance, the U.S. team said they would have problem with meeting me on Thursday and within, again, half an hour notice, all four of them were quick to meet me in my office. So this is the kind of uh, student behavior that, that I expect from you. Congratulations. And I, I know all others. I mean, all the rest of you deserve similar praise, and I will express this uh, just in front of all, all others. So that, you know, uh, what I expect from you as university students, take this time. This is the best time of your life. Trust me, and you will remember me in five, ten years' time when you get graduated. You have a family, you have a work and you will be yearning at days that you, you had passed here, you had spent here at the university, and so take the most advantage of it. All right, uh, going back to this uh, issue, um, and by the way, just another short uh, uh, sort of announcement about op-eds, sorry, about simulation. Um, if you encounter any trouble in meeting with the embassy people, please let me know, because as I said before, these people know me and my colleagues because this is International Relations Department and they get in contact with us from time to time. We have with some of them very good friendly personal relations. With others we have institutional relations. In case they either, I don't know, uh, ask too many questions as to why you want to meet them or they don't give you any, any appointment, please let me know. I can just uh, intervene and at some point maybe try to do uh, uh, something to facilitate your uh, establishing context. And, and other than that, please um, study uh, sort of, uh, and this must be done uh, according to a certain burden sharing agreement within the group. I mean, you should, each one, mem each member of the group should undertake a certain responsibility. For instance, one of you could uh, through the internet and through uh, uh, from other sources can uh, do a research, a search about what, for instance, the president of that particular country that you will be representing may have said uh, sort of uh, publicly with respect to the Iran issue, I mean, or the, the topic that you will be simulating. And uh, somebody else might just look at uh, uh, the websites of think tanks and the publications of think tanks and try to figure out what is the situation and because this, this simulation requires on the one hand a descriptive research, I mean things that you will have to get from different sources about the true position of that particular state and also you should uh, endow yourself with the capability to make analysis, all right? So uh, such uh, think tank reports or other analytical uh, writings may help uh, the, all of you to sort of make this um, interventions, especially in the second round. So uh, if you do that, you will see that 
you'll have uh, more joy and fun out of it, and also you will understand the subject matter very well. And at times, and if you th think it is this situation, please get in contact with other team members because uh, the policies, uh, foreign policies of some states in the Middle East are somehow interconnected, and therefore you can benefit from other groups' research. All right, so we were talking, we talk about all this stuff, I mean, uh, previously, but uh, the reason why I kind of uh, go back for, for a short while is to uh, you know, point to another issue, which is still, and indeed at the very core of the Middle East uh, debate, Middle East conflict, which is the Palestine problem, and the problem of the Palestinians. So Palestine problem is, of course, uh, has to do with the problem of the Palestinians, but they are not exactly the same thing. Palestine problem is a much wider problem, but the problem of the Palestinians and also problems uh, that the uh, countries in the, in, in the region have undergone sort of uh, over the last several decades because of the Palestinian issue or due to the Palestinian issue uh, uh, need, needs to be uh, uh, studied here. Um, of course, just very briefly, going back to uh, the Nasser period, one of the objectives of Nasser was to liberate Palestine and, and sort of uh, help the Palestinian cause and, and help with the Palestinians. But uh, as we have studied, uh, almost every time there was a war, there was an offensive against Israelis uh, with a view to liberating the uh, territories. Territories means the occupied territories. The territories that belong to Palestinian people in the minds of the um, Arab nations uh, that are now being occupied by, by Israel. So uh, the idea, every time they launch an offensive against Israel with a view to liberating the uh, territories occupied by Israel, they actually, let alone liberating Palestine, they lost uh, additional territories to, uh, to Israel. And, and of course, uh, we have seen the consequences on the regimes as well as on administrations and, and how these things have affected the countries in the region, Egypt, uh, Iraq, and Syria, and what kind of uh, dramatic changes these countries have undergone uh, because, of the, or the, because of the after effects of the war or the, the consequences of the war. But the Palestinians, of course, have been uh, and when look from uh, the human dimension, have been the uh, most uh, negatively affected group of people because they did not have a state, and each time there was a war, of course, they suffered the consequences and they had to flee the places, the locations where they were trying to live and migrated to other places. And this situation uh, in and of itself uh, has uh, sort of caused other additional troubles, other problems. Because um, when war started in 48, I mean, right following the uh, proclamation of the State of Israel, the Israeli uh, Palestinian refugee problem started because you know, they had to leave the territories where they had to, uh, uh, they, they used to live until that day. And they have gone, of course, uh, we have to bear in mind that we, can, we cannot talk about a unified sort of Palestinian identity. We, of course, mostly Muslim, but not all of them Muslim people. And not, of course, mostly you know, rural, uh, coming from rural areas, but not all of them. There was a certain uh, nobility, certain aristocracy, certain uh, uh, sort of people who had uh, higher uh, incomes as well as living standards. And those uh, who had such advantages uh, managed to you know, go to other countries in the region or to Europe, United States, Canada, and other places, and save themselves and their children and the next generations. But uh, a bulk of the Palestinian people suffer the consequence of wars. And of course, they, you know, as I said, they had to live in uh, different places uh, in Jordan and in the uh, countries uh, in the Gulf, work there to make, to make a living. And especially those who stayed within the Israeli territory, 
uh, as well as in, in Jordanian territory, and some of them eventually moved to Lebanon. Of course, they live in pretty uh, bad conditions, in, in camps and refugee camps, which were thought to be for tempor temporary period until there would be uh, a peace within, within the uh, uh, region, but that was always an elusive issue, elusive peace never uh, happened so far. So, and of course here we see, for instance, uh, when we talk about the consequences or implications of the 67 war, one issue was uh, Arafat, uh, Arafat's al Fati dominates the PLO. PLO actually was created uh, uh, by the Arab League. We talk about the Arab League, remember it was uh, established, it was founded in March 1945 with a view to advancing the Arab cause to provide coherence uh, among Arab policies and, and sort of uh, with a concerted action sort of defend the uh, Arab uh, identity, Arab uh, uh, values and of course Arab advantages or just have a consolidated Arab power but you know Arab League has never been uh, successful in, in achieving these goals and maybe even some of them. So uh, the, Arab, it, the PLO, Palestine Liberation Organization, was originally founded in 64 and with the uh, sort of no Palestinian nobility, I mean people uh, who had a certain degree of education, some uh, uh, sort of a better education when compared to the rest of the Palestinian people and it was not the PLO that we, most of you, probably know about today or the kind of image that you may have about PLO today or until recently was not the same as uh, when it was founded back in 64. And it was, you know, of course, uh, it, it aimed at, uh, first of all, gaining uh, a certain recognition, uh, not only within the Arab world but also in the rest of the world as being the sole, I mean the only representative of the Palestinians. Of course, the ultimate goal being uh, uh, the founder, the creator of the uh, Palestinian state. Because uh, with the UN Resolution 242, the uh, idea was to create actually two states, or at least that was the uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, the objective of those who drafted the resolution. Um, two states, Israel, Jewish and Palestinian state, uh, uh, side by side, living in the same territories. But of course, uh, there were some intriguing developments that we will not go into very much detail. The Israelis took advantage of the resolution, but Palestinians and our world failed to take advantage. And when you ask the Palestinians, of course, and our world, they put the blame on the Israelis who, and the big powers who uh, actually uh, a sort of question the sincerity of the Western world and they say the resolution was drafted, drafted in such a way that would of course blockade the way to creation of uh, the a state, of a Palestine, state of Palestine. Well anyway, leaving all this aside to uh, historians and to debate about this, um, the Palestinian Liberation Organization which was of course created, as I said, with a view to advancing the Palestinian cause at the international fora, in the international sort of uh, circles. Uh, again, affected, was affected from the 67 war. And following this, because as I said, Palestinians had fled to many countries in the region, have left their territories, have gone to Gulf countries, Kuwait, Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia, of course. Saudi Arabia has been a supporter of the Palestinian cause, not necessarily directly being involved in the politics, but rather by financial assets, by providing some uh, uh, sort of a support to Egypt in return for Egyptian support to Palestine or Palestinian people, directly or indirectly. Anyway, and, and because the Palestinian population was rather a younger population, and living under very difficult conditions. Of course, this situation was exploited by the groups which started to emerge within the Palestinian, uh, not only PLO, but also uh, all, all over the Palestinian um, sort of uh, communities. 
and Al Fati was one of them. Uh, Americans pronounce Al Fatah, while it is Al Fati, and Fati, you know, conquer. So, therefore, uh, and to conquer the, the to occupy territories back from the uh, Israelis. Uh, sounds nice, so you can let it go. <laughs> no, so, as long as you don't speak, no problem, right? Um, so, Therefore, the, we see the rise of Arafat to power, and of course, Al Fatih was not the only group within the Palestinian organization uh, uh, or Palestinian groups. So they advance uh, because the, the humiliation in the hands of the Israeli uh, army uh, of you know Egypt, uh, Syria, Palestinian uh, extremist groups or radical groups have. Uh, advanced the situation for advancing their, or exploited the situation for advancing their, their own cause and to promote their organization. Of course, on the one hand, they had to deal with the other Palestinian groups, and on the other hand, they had to um, devise a strategy as to how to, uh, uh, you know, liberate the uh, Palestinian territory from uh, occupied, occup Israeli occupation. And one of the methods uh, that they knew was, of course, use of uh, uh, violence against Israeli targets and to carry out some uh, um, attacks or some activities with a view to attracting the world's attention to the Palestinian cause. Well, sometimes terrorist organizations, and this is not you know, uh, something that you know, uh, unique to any one of them, of course, one of the... Uh, uh, objectives of a terrorist organization might be, you know, liberation of a certain territory, separation of a certain territory from a, you know, uh, from a country, or uh, advancing some political ideology. These may be situations, and sometimes they target a certain individual or a certain group of people, such as soldiers, uh, such as security forces, or a leader, political military, uh, or monarch, or someone from the administration, sometimes the peoples, I mean, uh, whom they target are the target, but sometimes uh, they are not necessarily the target, but the purpose is to attract the world's attention or the attention of some groups. And the victim is actually not the uh, target, but, you know, they, they know that by assassinating someone, by killing someone, they will attract more attention, and that person might be just, just be the victim of such a cause, not necessarily himself or herself, might have been someone who would otherwise like to kill. So uh, the, the objectives of terrorist organizations might be sometimes uh, confusing, but uh, those who are experts on terrorism studies uh, can make this distinction if, as to whether the person or group of people uh, was or were the target. Actually, um, for instance, on 9-11, I don't think those who hijacked the uh, airplanes and uh, sort of uh, hit the World Trade Center had any problem with anybody in working in the, uh, in the buildings. But uh, the idea was to shock the world, to send shock waves to the rest of the world, and 9-11, the, the attacks on 9-11, actually in that respect, unfortunately, reach uh, their, uh, achieve their objective. So therefore, uh, this is, in, in the 70s, we have seen, and I myself even remember that, uh, that there were some hijackings, and these hijackings of uh, airplanes were so frequent that people were, you know, started to laugh about it, or make jokes about it, as to whether, I mean, you know, uh, we will, you know, go to our destination, and we, uh, the flight time will be two hours and 25 minutes unless we are hijacked. And that, were, that kind of uh, jokes uh, started to emerge. So in the 70s and starting uh, with late 60s and almost throughout the first half of the 70s, hijacking aircraft in the Middle East was kind of routine and people were not even uh, noticing that after some while. So, and some of, and Palestinian groups were held responsible, and some of them, of course, uh, were very, very serious, because the hostage rescue operations have resulted in killing of a you know, large number of hostages, rather than the terrorists themselves. And therefore, uh, Mogadishu, for instance, uh, and, and there was also such incidents like the 1972 uh, um, Munich. Uh, 
Olympic Games during this Munich Olympic Games, you must have seen the, or you may have seen the movie Munich, uh, the, the Palestinian uh, terrorists just kill a number of Israeli uh, athletes, and of course this had had quite serious consequences, repercussions, and Israeli secret services uh, killed a number of uh, Palestinian people, Arab people, whom they uh, believed were responsible for such an act, and they killed these people in, in, in European capitals. So the 70s in that respect was uh, quite, quite nasty. I mean, it was, uh, it was really ugly in terms of uh, political developments. So um, this, this situation, the Palestinians, because they did not have any state, uh, and they was not, you know, a, a well-established top-down structure, and there were groups on the one hand fighting against Israel, and also on the other hand fighting against, uh, among themselves, in order to seize power and to have the sole voice, the, 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 the upper hand in, in determining the Palestinian uh, politics. So, uh, therefore, that situation went on quite, for quite some time. And um, as here, for instance, one of the things that the Palestinians uh, actually had to endure was the Black September event. Do you know anything about Black September? These are actually in your reading assignments that you are expected to have completed by today. I mean, even by last week. So the Black September was actually a real Black September, and there are such days, you know, Black September, Black October, whatever, in, in the financial markets when people lose uh, a lot of money. But this Black September uh, event is actually is no joke. It's, it's a very dark day uh, in the history of Palestinians because um, the Palestinian groups found uh, to be disturbing the situation in wherever they were living. And one of these places was Jordan, and the, after all, it was a kingdom, and it is a kingdom. And um, King Hussein found quite rather uh, destabilizing the Palestinian factor, and actually he, he was not happy with this situation. And uh, a raid, a military raid against uh, the Palestinian camps resulted in the killing of thousands of Palestinians in the hand of the Jordanian security forces, something that lasted for about a week or 10 days. So, and I mean, most people think of Israel as the entity uh, making life a hell for the Palestinians, but in the past, well, we're not, of course, talking about today. But in the past, the Palestinians also suffered from Jordanians, their fellow, fellow uh, Arab you know, uh, people. Um, so this is something, of course, that also caused them to seek for other headquarters or other, other places to leave and to stage their attacks against uh, Israelis. And one reason why they were thought to be a destabilizing factor was because they never stopped their attacks against Israel targets with whatever they had in their, in their power. And Palestinians never had uh, an army. Actually, even today, the uh, Palestinian Authority does not have the, the, uh, the, the capacity to, to maintain an army and doesn't have the right to ha have an army. But in the past, they had none that could be compared to anything like an army. And they had uh, uh, comparatively uh, lighter capabilities in terms of w weapons and munitions, but of course the military capabilities per se uh, are not necessarily sorry for that are not necessarily uh, uh, one item or one criterion that you should bear in mind. The impact is important. I mean, if you are capable of building very uh, sort of uh, crude weapons, but still kill large number of peoples with with these weapons they can be compared to even the most effective weapon which has the same or similar uh, killing or damaging capacity. So therefore, the Palestinian attacks have resulted in significant losses in terms of human lives in the, 
uh, among the Israeli uh, communities and also some damage to some of the Israeli facilities. So therefore, uh, they were being retaliated by the Israelis. So because they were living somewhere whereby they were attacking Israeli positions and Israel, of course, was uh, fighting in itself the right to retaliate back to these posts and these being in the, uh, within the Palestinian territories and therefore what, whichever country Palestinians lived uh, had unavoidably a trouble with Israel. So therefore, uh, this, that was one major reason as to why regions, uh, countries in the region uh, you know, considered the Palestinian problem a, to be a hot potato. I mean, this is this, there is this term, and no one wants to handle it. It's so hot that you don't want to uh, uh, sort of hold it. So um, therefore, that, that situation went on further. I mean, it, was not, it did not end with Black September. I mean, the Palestinians did not say, all right, we were slaughtered in the hands of the Jordanians, so therefore we, we, we give up. They did not say that, and they continued their, uh, their cause, to advance their cause in different fora, in, in different uh, places, one of which was Lebanon. So here we come, the, the impact of uh, the Palestinian factor on the Lebanese uh, politics. Uh, this, is, uh, this is important because Lebanon was in its, itself uh, you know, having trouble with many of its constituents. I mean, because there were different groups, different ethnic groups, I mean, not only Muslims and different ethnic Muslims, but also different ethnic Christians and different sort of groups within Lebanon, which was, uh, which had a certain balance. Uh, since the time of uh, French mandate, uh, all these territories were under the French mandate. And so they had established a certain degree of stability uh, by way of you know, promoting the Christians uh, uh, to certain posts and also establishing certain you know, um, institutional frameworks by means of which, in terms of administration, I mean, jurisdiction, legal issues, and administrative issues. So there was a certain degree of balance. I mean, of course, fragile, vulnerable, but somehow maintained. And, and, of and Syria, especially after the creation of the Syrian territory, uh, never uh, gave up its claims on the Lebanese territory, which they always thought would, have, would belong or belong to Syria, and always had a finger in, uh, or a certain role, of course, uh, uh, behind, the, behind the doors, behind the walls, uh, within the Lebanese politics. As I noted here, it rested on a very delicate, very fragile sectarian balance. And the presence, and when, once Palestinians moved uh, to Lebanon, of course this had had some sort of an impact on the fragile balance because Muslims were there, Christians, uh, Maronites, they, they were sort of uh, happy with the power that they had which, you know, you know they, they, they sort of understood each other and uh, they, they thought it would be in their best interest to continue the existing situation. But the Palestinian factor created division because, first of all, the demographic situation changed. The number of Palestinians who fled into the country or just uh, uh, flocked into the country after all these developments uh, the Yom Kippur War also had its own impact, uh, just like the 67 War. Each time war, as I said at the beginning, uh, uh, happened, uh, Palestinians were the worst to be affected from this. So uh, the, the Muslim uh, communities within Lebanon, of course, because of this affiliation, kinship, and uh, the, uh, the, their perception of the situation, they, some of them, if not all of them, supported the Palestinian cause. And we have seen, uh, I mean, uh, Lebanon witness a situation whereby the Palestinians uh, concentrated in certain parts of Lebanon, again, uh, at, you know, uh, attacking on Israeli posts, uh, you know, carrying out raids uh, uh, on the Israeli soldiers, wherever they were which, of course, each time called for retaliation more than in kind. 
And it is, uh, of course, something to do with the Israeli uh, way of thinking, Mitra way of thinking, uh, which is to retaliate more than in kind in order to deter the enemy to, to repeat the same mistake. But some, some countries, some, some people, some communities may understand that or may acknowledge that and therefore stop attacking Israel, for instance. I mean, that might be the, the Israeli expectation, but Palestinians uh, did not want to learn any, any such lesson. So, and they never stopped their attacks. And just, just until recently, we have seen in Lebanon again, uh, uh, just two years ago, uh, there was this offensive on southern Lebanon with a view to uh, finishing uh, Hezbollah, which, of course, uh, was not uh, uh, the, the result. So, therefore, what we have seen here uh, in, in Lebanon again, this, uh, this fragile balance was uh, tipped, was, was somehow disturbed, and um, it was not only between Israelis and uh, the Palestinians, but also within Lebanon, groups have started to uh, fight each other because of this uh, new element, Palestinians. So what we have seen was, again, uh, a civil war uh, in Lebanon, which uh, sort of uh, called into uh, the inter uh, called for the intervention of Syria at some point. Syria, which was sitting on the fence, on you know there is this term sitting on the fence. I mean, you just watch a certain thing, a certain developments, and you wait for the right time to intervene. When uh, from a position of strength, I mean, at, at, the, ver at the time that you think uh, your intervention would bring the most uh, uh, or the greatest advantage uh, to advance your cause. So, um, but this situation uh, got even worse with uh, Syrian intervention. But by the way, something to note here was uh, many of you might think, if you have not re you know, made uh, your readings, Many of you might think that Syria intervened on the side of Palestinians because Palestinians were Arabs and Muslim, just like uh, Syrians. Now you're wrong. Syria intervened to uh, actually help with or rescue the Maronites from uh, the scourge of uh, Palestinians. I mean, uh, so that has uh, taught some dear lessons to the Palestinians. Because you know, even if Syria intervenes on the side of their adversaries, I mean, who else could help? And for what reason uh, Arab nations could come together? So uh, eventually, uh, Israel, of course, which was very much disturbed with what was going on in uh, Lebanon, within Lebanon, because Lebanon had become the, uh, the, the headquarters of uh, uh, the Palestinian organizations, you know, staging attacks uh, on the Israeli post because you know, they are just you know, bordering each other. And that, that of course, uh, was, uh, has become a problem that uh, the Israelis wanted to get rid of. And one way Israel believes uh, it can put an end to a you know, uh, threat is to eradicate it, is, is to eliminate it. And the Israeli inter invasion of Lebanon in 1982 which resulted in the killings or slaughterings of Palestinians in the hands of the uh, uh, Falange guerrillas in Sabra and Shatila, the refugee camps, and they killed thousands of people, uh, uh, regardless of whether they were elderly people, children, or men and women, and most because it was the time when Palestinians had agreed to some groups at least had agreed to leave their arms and find a lasting solution to this uh, situation in, in, in the region. So all this, of course, uh, had added much more heat, tension, uh, and of course, uh, the situation has not improved even a bit uh, since. Well, some improve, improvements we have seen uh, maybe over the last few years, I mean, after so many years, the, the uh, Lebanon has become, of course, as we will see in a moment, 
with the in, in intervention of Iran into the picture, with the entering of Iran into the picture, the situation has gotten even worse. And we have seen the impact of Iran, Islamic Republic of Iran, not Shah's Iran. Uh, the, it's uh, entering into the picture and you know, having very close links with Hezbollah in Lebanon and, uh, and the Lebanese politicians at some point uh, sort of complicated the situation uh, a little more. Uh, do you have any questions about anything that we talked about so far? Because I want to continue with uh, the, some of the other developments, especially the Iranian situation next hour. Because, and I want to sort of um, finish this historical part, if I may say so, uh, today and start with uh, more important developments uh, that have taken place in the 1990s and 2000s until now. Of course, uh, the most important development being Iraq's invasion of Kuwait and, of course, the events that followed. So, any questions about this? Yes, Fatih, go ahead. What, what is the question? Was closed? Yes. Well, because in, in the 67 war, uh, both uh, east and west banks of uh, the Sinai Peninsula and the canal were under Israeli occupation. Other questions? All right, let's give a break. Some of you might want to have a coffee. And let's come back in 10 minutes.